Welcome back to the Terrace Garden. You would never know it, but today is one of my favorite days of the year. It's January, it's raining, it's not that pretty outside at all, but today I'm going to start my fig cuttings. This will be my third season propagating fig cuttings. I'm adding three new varieties to the garden. I'm probably going to be expanding this space next spring to make some more room. I'm also going to be cloning copies of the trees that I already have in ground. I took extra cuttings this year just to have copies even of my first year trees should they not be able to survive the cold weather in ground. Most of the varieties I have in ground are cold hardy. There's one or two that are not. And I'm also going to try a few this coming season that are definitely not or historically have not been cold hardy in zone 6b. So I'm going to take you through the process of how I propagate fig cuttings. There are countless ways to do this. The best advice I can give you up front is to have fun with it. I'll walk you through some of the things I've learned over the past few years about how this process works, how to be successful at it, how to have fun. Let's go check it out. All right, I am really excited for this. I can't tell you how excited I am. This is going to be wonderful. Let's talk about materials. First thing you're going to need is a good pair of pruners. This is my Akatsune 104 pruner. Really big fan of these. They've gotten a fair amount of use this season. You can check out the review I did on those. That's the Akatsune 104, the larger size that they have. Next, I can't say enough good things about Clonex. This is a rooting gel. This is a hormone that will more or less burn the tissue of the fig cutting and instigate growing roots. I've tried rooting figs with and without this and the difference is enormous. This is a purple gel that is applied to the bottom of the cutting. Essentially what it is doing is tricking the tree into scarring, forcing root development. Next you're going to need cuttings. Most of these are backup copies that I've already taken. I store everything in a resealable bag in the crisper drawer of our refrigerator. I have not washed or sterilized these at all. They're right off the tree. You can kind of see they were really dry to begin with, so they pretty much look close to how they did the day I took them. The left side of cuttings are fig trees that I already have. These are mainly backup copies in case something wouldn't make it through the winter in ground. In a couple of instances I'd want to have a duplicate copy. Oro Bianco that is a gorgeous fig. It has a variegated yellow and green fruit. It's a little easier to see with unlignified growth, but the wood itself is, is also variegated, which is really cool. And I wouldn't be too surprised if the leaves ended up doing the same thing. So I'd like to have a few more of those. I have one in ground in my dirt locker terrace garden. Be trialing a few things in ground. That system, which you'll see in other videos, has, I think, a thermal advantage. On the right side, I have three fig cuttings from off the beaten path nursery. I-258, this is a really popular cutting, one of the better choice varieties, I would say. With our shorter growing season, this will probably live in a pot for the first year until I have maybe one or two copies, and then I'll try planting it in ground over winter. Next, I have Randino. This was found in Texas and trialed in Ukraine, so this should have no problem handling our winters here. This fig is about the size of LDA, 60 to 80 grams, except it has a brown sugar flavor to it. And my third new variety is Bergen Unknown. This is a mid-season fig with a reddish purple skin and a strawberry red flesh. A fruity, sweet fig. I'm just taking notes off of off the beaten path nursery's description for those cuttings. One issue I've ran into in the past is having figs dry out. That was more of an issue my first year. Last year it wasn't quite as big of a deal, but this year I'm just going to take saran wrap and cover the ends of the figs just to keep moisture locked in. You can use parafilm, you can use grafting tape. None of those are really biodegradable anyway, and I have cling wrap here, so I'm just going to use that to cover all the ends to keep them from drying out. On a terminal end like this where you have a bud or a leaf node at the end that's not quite as critical. For containers, I like using quart size food grade containers. There are a few advantages. You can see the root growth as it's developing. Kind of get an idea of the health and the pacing of your propagation. If you've overwatered, you'll be able to see the water level at the bottom of the container. So that'll kind of give you an idea of how quickly your soil is absorbing. I've tried other containers in the past where the, the sides aren't quite as smooth. This is easier to pull the cutting out. Once it's rooted, there's nothing on the sides for it to grab. You can put holes in the bottom if you're worried about drainage, but again, being able to see through the container, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. 
I've heard people worried about the tree putting out leaves instead of roots on account of light penetration, but with soil or whatever rooting medium around here you're going to use, it's dark. I've never had that be a problem before, so this is my choice of container. I'm going to need a few more than I've kept on hand, so I will use a gallon size container for fig cuttings. You can also put multiples in here if you want to try growing. Two or even three will work. It'll help you save space, but if you wait too long, separating the roots can be kind of a pain. From left to right, I have vermiculite, perlite, and peat moss. In the past, I've used a 50-50 mix of vermiculite and perlite and had pretty good success. Blends of peat moss and perlite are also pretty, pretty popular. Vermiculite and, and perlite, they're both minerals, so it's sort of hilarious to see packaging talk about them being organic. They're basically sterile minerals, but vermiculite is porous. It sort of has some flex to it, kind of looks like mica. You can kind of get an idea of how light. Perlite, this is a volcanic glass. This is very dusty to handle. For either of these, I recommend being outside. Use at your own risk. You don't want to inhale any of the dust from, from these media, so try to be in a well-ventilated area if you're going to use them. Peat moss, this is a Canadian sphagnum moss. Peat moss is going to retain more moisture than these two media. Perlite is going to help with aeration. Vermiculite is going to help with water retention. I have a third of a bag of each of these three, so this year I'm going to try mixing all three. I know some people just use potting soil. I've also heard stories of people being successful simply planting their cutting in the ground. I think there's a lot of fuss about which media people want to use. If you ask a dozen people what their preferences are, you're probably going to get two dozen answers. The main considerations are to keep your fig cutting from drying out and rotting. Whatever media and environment you think can best handle that, go for it. My cuttings are going to live indoors. The biggest enemy I've had is airflow from our heating, our central air. Moving air is going to dry things out, so I think this year having some kind of parafilm or cling wrap on the end will help keep them from drying out, and I'm curious to see how the peat moss affects growth. I think it also might be less of a shock to up pot it. When just using vermiculite and perlite, the root structure can start to kind of come apart a little bit. I'm going to use a larger container to mix everything up, and just so you can get an idea of how dusty everything is. Here's the vermiculite. Not too bad. The perlite. Has quite a bit of dust, so definitely do this outdoors. One measure you can take that'll solve two problems at once is to add water. So this will help keep the dust down. It will also mean that you don't have to water your plants right off the bat, which can be very helpful. Kind of having a, a damp, damp rooting media to start rather than trying to figure out how much water to add later. You don't want it soggy, but and again, I think damp is really the best, the best descriptor for it. Still fluffy, could probably add a little bit more water to that, but for right now I think this is good for filling containers. Alright, let's get these cuttings prepped. I'm going to start by wrapping the ends. Quick tip on the direction here. Hopefully your cutting is marked on the upward portion so that as it's planted you'll know, you'll know what variety it is. But if you can't tell, your new nodes will grow on top of where there's a leaf a leaf scarring. So that'll kind of help give you an idea of which direction is up. It is not a great idea to cover the entire cutting. That'll trap in too much moisture and for sure cause it to rot. So we're just trying to cap the ends off so there's just enough protection to keep it from drying out. This is Smith. I'm going to label that quick using an oil-based Sharpie. If you have a favorite paint marker, let me know in the comments below. Yeah, really not a fan of these markers. Trust the reviews, these things leak everywhere. That's finished. Let's finish wrapping these ends up. The cut ends are all wrapped in cling wrap, so they're not going to dry out. The next order of business is going to be to scar the lower end of each cutting to kind of help with root growth, and actually what I'm going to do also is just clean up the end. 
in each cutting so that it's got some new green tissue at the bottom. These scores are very light. I'm not even sure how necessary they are. I've had air layers take without without that. All these little bumps and nodes are going to be what start to put out new growth. There you can see a good before and after. If you want, you can cut at an angle to have more surface area. This cutting is three quarters of an inch thick, and this pruner went right through it. This is a cutting that I took right before I started today, so I don't need to make a new clean cut. And there's no sap or moisture running out of, out of the bottom of these cuts at all. They were taken when the trees were dormant, so no issues there. It's going to make a home for each cutting to fall into. That way some of the rooting hormone doesn't get brushed off. Best use of that marker so far. It's really soft and light, airy. There's just a little moisture to it to make it kind of sticky. Alright, so the Clonex. This is going to get applied along the bottom. I've never used this at the beginning of the season. I've only ever done it to root air layers and also to kind of bring back some stubborn cutting. So I'm really excited to see how this does. covering up just the first node, packing in just enough to keep it in place, and moving on to the next cutting. You can still see the label very nicely. Just covering the first node. There we go. If you had this cutting has one, two, three, four nodes, I'm gonna bury two. Double my chances since I have two above. I'll keep two below. Alright, let's fast forward and go through the rest of these. There we go, a dozen cuttings. So they're all in one container, I can move them in and out of the house as I need to. Could have drilled holes in the bottom, but you'll be able to see how much water is in here as they're, as they're growing. I'm going to give them just a little bit more once they're in place. And then we wait from here, just hoping that everything takes, especially these three new trees, I-258, Randino, and Bergen Unknown. Those are the three varieties that I'm really pulling for the most. Smith would probably be next because I only have one of those, and also Oro Bianco because I have that in ground, and I'm not sure if it's cold hardy, so we're going to find out together, as we used to say at Apple. Let's find out together. I know it might just seem like a bunch of sticks in potting soil, but this is a really amazing day because from here on out, every day I have something to look forward to once they start to wake up and grow and turn into trees. So when it's dreary outside and there's no green to be found, there will be a little nursery here. 
hopefully you learned something. Again, there's dozens of ways to do this. This is just how I go about the process, and hopefully if you haven't done this before, this will maybe make the process a little easier for you. Stay tuned for progress updates. Let me know what questions you have, and thanks for watching.